Classroom Social Norms, Part 2. I'm Cynthia McAllister. So, how are norms effectively used? How do you explicitly teach them? What are the procedures you need to follow to make sure social norms are a central part of the curriculum? Number one, hold students accountable to enforcing the norms of their classroom. Responsibility to enforce norms has traditionally been assigned to the teacher alone, leaving students to be only responsible for doing what they're told. When students enforce rules within the formats as directives to their peers, and when peers respond with commitments to change behavior, students engage in an active process of norm learning or internalizing. They're holding the rule in mind while relating it to actions. Research has demonstrated that children are naturally inclined to enforce rules. Michael Tomasello explains, and I'll quote, true social norms based on reciprocity emerge in the late preschool period as children lose their egocentrism and begin to see others and themselves as co-equal autonomous agents. Not only do children actively follow social norms, but from almost as early as they follow them, they also participate in enforcing them." End quote. This inclination comes from the child's sense of personal identification with the group and their appreciation for being part of it. This sense of we-ness that is rooted in the social-emotional capacities of being a human being. If norms can be enforced by peers as well as teachers, then it's a terrible waste not to take advantage of the fact that students want to and are effective in securing positive social norms. And if the process of learning norms depends on opportunities to hold a rule in mind and grasp the connection between the rule and one's actions, traditionally established teacher-dominated practices for teaching norms leave students missing out on important opportunities to learn norms through self-responsibility and norm-reference social interaction. Learning cultures formats distribute rule enforcement to students, harnessing peer pressure to enforce social norms that will help impact learning. So just remember when you find yourself in a format and things begin to go off the rails before you start to assume authority and take control, ask yourself, how can I hold the other students accountable to enforcing the rules? Number two using the rubric as an instructional tool. Rubrics should be used in several ways as tools for teaching the norms. The first thing you might want to do is create a rubric binder. A complete set of rubrics should be bound and filed in a location where they're readily accessible to both students and the teacher. At any point when a student is not living up to his or her responsibilities, pull the rubric binder and reference the indicator that the student isn't adhering to. This is a helpful self-regulation activity to enable the student to internalize the norms of the classroom. This activity also diffuses a potential authority struggle. When you respond to problematic behavior through the status of what's essentially the codified ordinances of the rubrics, the conflict will remain impersonal and you'll avoid the more confrontational possibility that the situation will be viewed by the student as an unfair misuse of your authority. Next, teach the rubrics at the beginning of the school year. If learning cultures is practiced school-wide and students switch classes, determine with your grade team which classes will cover the rubric lessons for which formats. Then, post student sections of the rubrics where the format takes place so that they can be referenced when behavior goes off track. Cut the student portion of each rubric and laminate it. Post it or make it available in the location where the format occurs so that you and others can reference the student responsibility section. For example, you can laminate the student section of cooperative units and reading and place one in each of the cooperative units and reading bins. Next, use the rubric in behavior conferences. Refer to the specific indicators when discussing problematic behaviors with students. Again, the rubrics are a tool in de-escalating problematic behaviors. Students are much more responsive when they can view their behavior as an infraction of a classroom law as opposed to a guilty party in a personal conflict. And finally, use the rubrics as a self-assessment tool. 
Rubrics can be used as a tool for professional development and help teachers identify their strengths, needs, and goals. The rubrics can also be used to provide peer feedback. When teachers do inner visitations with colleagues, the rubrics can be used as a tool to help focus their analysis and the way they talk about what they observed in one another's classrooms. Number three, the social contract talk, establishing a positive school-wide culture. The social contract talk is a presentation that is designed to help students understand that education is a right that has been achieved through a history of social struggle and sacrifice, and that with this special right, comes responsibility. The talk is presented in several sections. First, education is contextualized in a discussion of human and civil rights. We want kids to understand and appreciate that even though they may take education for granted, it's a right that hasn't always existed. In our country, children were once viewed as a source of labor. The whole idea of childhood as we know it today didn't exist. As soon as they were able, children were expected to work to help provide for their families. And in many countries, this is still the view held. We discuss child labor and the labor rights movement, which won certain protections for children not to have to work and to be able to attend school. We also discuss school segregation and how the right to a free public education was expanded to minorities through the civil rights movement and desegregation. Next, we discuss education as an investment that society makes in its youth. In New York, society invests about a quarter of a million dollars in every student over the course of their schooling. We divide that sum by years, days, hours, and even minutes so that the kids can calculate the cost of lost opportunities. We talk about the fact that each student has a responsibility to determine how she or he will make the most potential out of this investment. And we discuss how when kids don't adhere to their responsibilities and when they waste classroom time, they're essentially stealing valuable opportunities from others. We also discuss the economic benefits of an education and share data about predicted compensation relating to education levels. Then we reference New York City's Code of Discipline with a focus on students' rights and responsibilities. We read each right and responsibility in unison. The New York City Discipline Handbook names two important responsibilities that we spend time discussing. The first is that every student should make every effort to achieve. And the second is that every student should provide leadership to encourage fellow students to follow school policies and practices. We make a point to help students understand that the policies and practices of our school include the learning culture's formats, that it's an expectation for all students to follow the format procedures, and that these procedures provide a context for every student to enjoy maximal freedom. We explain that helping fellow students adhere to the procedures is a way of keeping them in a circle of freedom. Once students experience difficulty self-regulating to the procedures, they're at risk of losing these freedoms. Once this is discussed, we talk about the kinds of behaviors that get in the way of students' rights and responsibilities and make a list. And then we ask, what should happen if kids shirk their responsibilities and break the rules? We lead students in a discussion of appropriate responses to violations of behavior expectations and help them create a list of progressive responses that can be used in every classroom. They actually put the responses in the order that they want them to happen. So, let's talk about talk logistics. I suggest that every class of student gets an opportunity to hear the social contract talk in the first week of school. The principal or deans can give the talk in each class, or students can convene in the auditorium to hear the talk together. When everyone has heard the same message, that they have a responsibility for their learning and will be expected to live up to it, positive social norms are more easily and quickly secured because every student who contemplates overstepping the boundaries of a rule will do so having heard that non-cooperation takes from their peers opportunity to learn. The social contract talk presents a logistical challenge. It's long, it can take up to 60 minutes, 
and the school leadership needs to determine how the talk will be presented. Doing the talk in each and every classroom is an onerous task at the start of a busy school year. Some alternative possibilities are combining classes of students to hear the talk together or convening new students and incoming students in the auditorium. The talk can be made accessible digitally or in text form and the social contract talk should be on the incoming checklist for new students so that there's a method to ensure that every student has heard the talk. The social contract talk can have a big impact. It's like a magic personal agency potion to some kids who've never viewed their education as someone else's considerable investment in them. And few have ever viewed the disruptive antics of a classmate as being of any personal consequence or as a case of someone else taking from an investment made in them. The more common mindsets of don't tattle or stop snitching or mind your own business and I'll mind mine prevail in schools. If the talk is done well, it can be a tool to help shift these mindsets because these mindsets do need to be shifted in order for the classroom culture to be positive. The fact that every student has heard the talk provides not just an invitation, but also an imperative for students to view the assertion of their disapproval of disruptive behavior as doing the right thing, as opposed to selling out. It also makes public knowledge of the fact that students who disrupt others are literally robbing others of their right to learn. Once students have heard the talk, they become more vigilant about their rights and are more willing to enforce social norms. And for the habitually disruptive, defiant, or disrespectful ones, it puts them on notice that their behaviors aren't simply an act of opposition to the teacher, but a violation of the rights of their classmates. This awareness seems to have a significant impact on many students who would otherwise continue to show challenging behaviors. The social contract talk will budge the classroom culture somewhat, provided positive social norms are secured through adequate follow-through when students fail to meet their responsibilities. But of course, there will be those students who continue to act out, who remain alarmingly passive or unwilling to invest effort in their own education. For those students, a behavior or academic intervention is the next line of response. Number four, the ladder of self-regulation. An outcome of the social contract talk will be a list of consequences or responses for infractions of the rules. Once suggestions from each class of students has been collected, the school's leadership team for school culture and discipline should use insights to develop a ladder of self-regulation to be posted in every classroom. Usually the ladder starts with a peer reminder, moves to a teacher reminder, moving seats, and so on and so forth. Because social norms are an integral facet of the curriculum and because they need to be taught explicitly and internalized, the ladder is an educational tool. It should be used and referred to whenever a student is breaking the rule and needs support in re-regulating their behavior according to norms. So hold yourself accountable to using it as an educational tool rather than a punitive one. Number five, the Behavior Reflection and Behavior Conference. Every school's ladder of self-regulation should include two rungs, the Behavior Reflection and the Behavior Conference. When students have demonstrated that they're not able to re-regulate themselves to expectations independently, typically after they've been reminded by peers and the teacher and after they have moved their seats, a behavior reflection is the next step. Students move to a quiet place and fill out the form. You'll find a copy of the form in the resources section of this lecture. If the opportunity to reflect on problematic behaviors and commit to changed behavior doesn't result in successful re-regulation, a behavior conference is in order. Typically, because teachers are otherwise involved in participating in other formats, the on-call or backup teacher is called to either conduct a behavior conference or to assume responsibility for the format in action so that the teacher, the classroom teacher, can conduct the behavior conference. So that brings us to number six, backup call. Every school should have a backup or on-call team to respond to behavior incidents in the classroom. Especially at the beginning of the year, it's important that every teacher in the school be supported in securing positive social norms in the classroom. The on-call system helps ensure this happens. When a student's behavior escalates to the point when it requires individual teacher attention, and the classroom teacher is unable to give that attention, the backup is called. 
deans, assistant principals, or teachers can be assigned to the on-call system. A record of response should be kept so data accumulates that can serve to help staff understand patterns in problematic behavior and response, both to improve educational systems and to share with individual students as competence feedback. There's a paradox to the freedoms in the learning culture's classroom. The cultural archetype of the typical classroom casts the teacher as an authority who asserts control over others. In these settings, the acquisition of knowledge is entangled with the requirement of obedience. Teachers typically make the rules and students obey them. As discussed, in authoritarian contexts, rules can be minimal. Sit where assigned, don't talk, raise your hand if you wish to speak. They're easy to enforce, easy to understand. But in situations where greater freedoms must be exercised, rules need to be more comprehensive and specific. And in situations in which freedoms have had to be earned or achieved, they need to be guarded and protected so that they aren't eroded by the forces of tradition, convention, or internal norms of subgroups within the school. Within the learning cultures model, format rules are constraints that disentangle learning from obedience, enabling students to enjoy freedom and independence and to exercise agency toward meeting learning goals. The format rules function like black letter law. Just as laws protect citizens' basic freedoms in a democracy, the rules of the formats help ensure consistent and high quality learning experiences for students. The more freedoms there are to protect, the more rules are necessary to protect them. Freedom without norms that pattern and organize social behavior easily deteriorate into chaos. You can think of rules on a continuum with freedom. On one extreme, there are few rules, but few freedoms. And on the other extreme, there are many freedoms which, in order to be protected, are spelled out in rules. So let's summarize and review. In this lecture, I presented a range of strategies that you can follow to secure and sustain positive social norms in your school and classroom. 